about how love hurts. Love hurts, and it does. And in some ways, I could say I'm preaching to the choir because all of you know through the experiences of your life, you have experienced heartache and pain in relationships. You know how love can hurt. Well, today we're going to help us understand a little more about where that all fits in to your relationship with Jesus. Let's take our Bibles in hand, if you would, please. Take your Bible. Stand with me as we make this declaration together. This is my Bible. It is the incomparable, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I choose to live as it calls me to live. I am open and ready to receive from God's living Word. You may be seated in open ups to Acts 14.23. i got to tell you about a lady who understood the cost of love. Her husband passed away. And you understand, everybody experiences grief a little differently. They all process grief a little differently. It was about a week after the funeral, and she was out to coffee with a friend of hers, and the friend was trying to comfort her and encourage her. And she said, well, how are things going? She says, well, everything's good except the finances. She said, I thought... I thought your husband had a $50,000 life insurance policy. He did. But everything related to the funeral cost $50,000. She said, how could that be? She said, well, the funeral home was $10,000. And then the the burial plot with the perpetual care and the vault was another $5,000. And then the memorial stone was 35000 She said, $35,000 for a memorial stone? How big was the stone? She said, four carats. Oh, yes. Okay, so everybody experiences grief a little differently. <laughs> Acts chapter 14, (laughs) verse number 23. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Wow, this is good. We're going to talk, first of all, about the cost of caring, because caring has a cost. And you know that. Caring has a cost. And sometimes it's a really big one, isn't it? Some say that caring makes you more human. I suppose there's a sense of truth to that. But even more than that, caring makes you godly. Really? Mm -hmm. But caring always also comes at a cost. And sometimes it can lead to hurting very very deeply. Pain that can last for a tremendously long time. C.S. Lewis, you know C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia. He was a Christian author. He wrote this in, in The Four Loves. He wrote, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully, round with hobbies, little luxuries, avoid entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, Safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. Now, obviously, he's not advocating that you 
pull away from relationships. He's talking about the reality that love hurts. And it does. There's a cost to caring. And throughout your life, you are going to invest in people and in relationships because we are created for relationships. Some people in those relationships, some people are going to break your heart. It's going to happen. Your heart is going to get broken. And some situations are going to break your heart because of how they affect the people that you love. Hurt is inevitable. Pain is inevitable. Misery, that's depending upon what you're going to do with your pain. (laughs) Though it may not seem like it at the time, and many times it does not. You need to know, though, that the rewards of love are worth the price of pain. The rewards of love are worth the price of pain. They are worth the risk, even though it's scary sometimes. Just ask Al. Oh, you, you've probably read a little of Alfred Tennyson, very popular poet, English poet. In fact, he, he was the favorite poet of Queen Victoria. Alfred was around in England from 1809 to 1892. During that time, he he went to Trinity College and met a friend there, a friend that he became very, very close to. His name was Arthur Henry Hallam. They were both writers of poetry and became best buddies. (laughs) Arthur fell in love with Alfred's little sister. And so (laughs) Arthur spent a lot of time there too because his best friend Alfred was there and his girlfriend that he he was planning to marry. Yeah, in fact, he spent three Christmases there and was really getting tight with the family. Time had come, though, that... Dad wanted Arthur to go on a trip with him, to head over to Paris for a bit, and they did. Arthur fell asleep in the chair. His dad goes over to shake him. We're going to go out. Time to eat. But Arthur wasn't asleep. Arthur had a brain aneurysm, and at age 22, age 22, Arthur was dead. Word gets back to Alfred. Alfred was devastated. His best friend, who was going to be his brother-in-law, his best friend was gone. And he felt like life had dealt him the most miserable and harsh blow that it possibly could. And Those of you that know the loss of someone you love, the death of a relationship or the the loss of an individual. You know, you don't get over it. Some people will will expect people that are in mourning, well, just get over it. It's, It's been a couple of weeks or it's been a few months. Get over it. Move on. You don't get over it. You adjust to it. You carry it with you. Alfred grieved for a very long time. He's like in his 40s. 17 years after the death of his friend Alfred, he finally begins to express his feelings, his emotions on this. He writes a poem called In Memoriam A.H.H. for Arthur Henry Hallam. And in that, that 133 
line poem where it's really, it's, it's called a cantus, which means it's shorter lyric poems all put together. So he's got a lot of grief to express, and it's, it's, it's long. But you actually know this poem, at least this portion, this cantum. He said, I hold it true, whate'er befall. I feel it when I sorrow most. Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. And you've heard that many times throughout your life. It's better to have loved and lost than to never to have loved at all. The rewards are bigger than the risk. Though the pain can be so great, what you take away, what you carry with you, the meaning, the value that it places on and in your life it's worth it. It's worth it. But caring has a cost. At times it can seem so overwhelming and so painful, especially when you're really close to the event. It can seem so painful. But love does not only make you more human. It makes you more godly. How? How? Because you are created in the image of God. And in his very image, that image of relationship, what, what did Father say? Let us, us, make man after our image, after our likeness. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together creating humanity in his image. Did he make you in his physical image? No, 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 no. It's a moral image. It's a natural image. It is a spiritual image. It is a, it's an emotional image. You are created to have emotions like God. Now, of course, from the fall of man, our emotions, they're screwed up. That's a reality. But God is working to redeem those emotions. To help you when I have healthy emotions. And one of those healthy emotions, of course, is love. To love his way. And if you're going to follow after God, you are going to naturally love. In fact, John put it this way in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. He said, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Hmm. When it says God is love, it doesn't mean God is just an emotion. No, 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 no. It's not identifying God as an emotion. It's using an anathorist noun which describes the nature and character. It's saying the very essence and nature and character of God is love. That's what he's like. So naturally... You created in his image, you are created to be a person to love, to give love, to receive love. If you are not experiencing love in your life, you sense something's lacking. And it's not just experiencing it in the sense of receiving it, it's also the act of giving love because you were created to be a loving person. Love makes you more godly because God is love. I want to talk to you, though, in part two here about the crisis Paul is going through here in, in commending. 
and the pain that he's experiencing in love. Because Paul understood the deep emotional duress that can come from caring. He knows the pain, expresses the pain of how it can hurt to love. Now, Luke writes for us in Acts 14, 23, so when they appointed elders in every church, prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they believed. They commended them. (laughs) But, But who are the they's and who are the them's? Right? Kind of need to know who the they's and them's are. Well, the they's are Paul and his ministry team. And at this point, that means Paul and Barnabas and others who have come alongside them and are journeying with them and helping them. They are the ministry team. And the them's Well, the thems are those disciples which Paul, Barnabas, and the other members of the team have led to Jesus, prayed with them to receive Christ, baptized them, discipled them. They have invested deeply in them. Paul, in fact, at Lystra, nearly died for them. They invested in them. But now they have to leave. And it kind of stinks because it's, it, it's, they're leaving these young believers, new believers, and it's like they feel like they're almost abandoning them. You say, well, they could just call them up on the phone, you know, and just check on how they're doing. <laughs> no. No phone, no cell phone, no instant messaging. No messenger, no internet. And you can't even depend on the post office because there actually is no such thing as a post office. When you write a letter, you either have to have somebody personally take that, and that's a long journey, or hopefully somebody can pass it on to somebody else who can pass it on to somebody else, pass it on to somebody else to take it. And it might, after a few months, actually arrive, maybe. There's a sense of we're leaving and there's a disconnection that goes on there. You and I maybe don't experience that on the same level because we are never disconnected in life today like they were. Let's face it, it's, FaceTime is a really cool gift, isn't it? It's fun. I can connect with my grandkids on FaceTime. It's like I'm almost there. We need to realize Paul was commending them with an uncertainty of even if he would even see them again. So commending them means he's turning them over to the Lord. Jesus, you're going to have to take care of them because I won't be here. I can't do anything. I won't even know what's going on. Jesus, I'm going to have to turn them over to you. There's a sense of desperation that comes with it. There's a sense of unfinished work. There's an insecurity that it carries. But he said, I'm putting them in your hands, Lord. What else, what else can I do? In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, if you flip over there for just a moment, you take a right turn from Acts past Romans and past 1 Corinthians. You come to 2 Corinthians, and you get to the end of 2 Corinthians, chapter number 11, and you see Paul mentions there about all the things that he's gone through. Starting at verse 23, are, are they ministers of Christ? I'm, I'm more. He says, in stripes above measure, prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews I received 40 stripes minus one. Five times received that. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the cities, in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils with my false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst, in fastings, often in cold and nakedness. Besides, 
besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Wow. No matter what's going on, no matter where he is, what's transpiring, his mind keeps going back, I hope they're doing okay. I hope things are all right in Derby. I hope that things are okay in Lystra. I hope that Antioch, Pisidia is, is going to be faithful under the persecution I'm sure they're facing. I hope so-and-so is doing okay, that they're staying on with the Lord. I hope that, they're, that so-and-so, when we left, wasn't well. I hope they're feeling better constantly. And Paul doesn't just say he's, yeah, he thinks about them. He's not giving his thoughts and prayers. Not in a trite sense. No, 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 no. Paul says he is more than slightly concerned. It actually uses deeply concerned in our translation from the word merimna, which means he was fractured over it. This broke him in pieces. It fractured him over it. So he, he understands how love can hurt. How truly caring about people, how putting yourself out there, being vulnerable, can be so stinking painful. How it can absorb so much of your life. How you can feel fractured. Every day his attention was split between dealing with what was in front of him and, and what the converts were going through without him. Does that mean that Paul was not trusting God? And the answer is no. 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 Now you still think, well, maybe if he had a little more faith. <laughs> I'm talking about Paul here, okay? <laughs> this is not a lack of trust that he was fractured and his heart was breaking. Caring doesn't mean living in fear and being plagued by anxiety. We, we do need to trust God, yes. We need to commend our loved ones to God. And there are some times that you and I have to face a reality. We can't help some people. <laughs> there are some times I want to. There are some times I want to take someone and smack them alongside the head and say, stop being so stupid. <laughs> Don't you realize what you're doing is going to hurt you? They're going to have consequences, and those consequences are going to devastate your life and the people that you love. Knock it off. <laughs> uh, obviously, though, that would be assault and battery. <laughs> and... Uh, I don't know if they'll let me out for Huber to come and preach for you. <laughs> there are some times you, you, you can't. All you can do is say, okay, God, I, I can't change them. I can't, I can't grab them and pull them out of it. I can't take it for them. I just got to turn them over to you. And sometimes you have to do that with kids. Sometimes you have to do that with spouses. Sometimes you have to do that with friends. Sometimes you have to do that with family members. You have to say, I can't do anything. And it can frustrate you. But you say, I, I can do one thing. I can do this. I can turn them over to you. Now, this is important to understand. This is not just a last resort. This should be our first resort. I am turning them over to as Paul or as Luke records for us, the Lord in whom they had believed. And you need to believe this, that the Lord in whom you have believed loves that person even more than you do. That's hard to believe sometimes. It's hard to believe the Lord can love your kids more than you do, your spouse more than you do, your friends or your family more, but he does. He loves them even more than you do, and you can and you should. You must commend them to the Lord. Turn them over to God and say, Lord, I don't have the ability to deal with this. I can't change it, 
but I'm turning them over to you that you will touch them in it, help them through it, and that as they go through it, you will be with them, and when they come out the other side, they will learn what you want them to know so that they can live the life that you want them to have. The reality is caring does make you vulnerable, and you may do everything, everything that you possibly can, and it still will not seem like enough. But it does not mean that you are bad. You find yourself still caring, your heart's still out there. It doesn't mean that you're bad. It doesn't mean that you're failing. It doesn't mean that you are not spiritual enough. It means that you are sharing his love for them. You understand that? I made a very vulnerable prayer. Mm. But my pastor told me I should. <laughs> pastor Daniel said, Mark. That's because he's you're sitting in the front row right there. And I said, yes, sir, Pastor. That was Pastor Spina in Appleton when I was a teenager. That's where you sit, right there. Yes, sir. He said, because the anointing's in the first row. <laughs> <laughs> he may have been throwing a joke at that point I didn't know I was just going to do what my pastor told me to do he said when I give the altar call you get right there you respond to what God does in your life now here's this pastor Spina he's a big old Italian guy and it's like I don't do what he says the spiritual mafia might come for me <laughs> You respond to what God does in your heart. Yes, sir. And I, I, I go to that altar and, he's, and you surrender everything to God. Everything, you give it to God. And then you tell God, I want your heart. I want to love like you love. I want to care like you care. Even if it tears you apart. Yes, sir. Know this, that when you're loving and it's hurting, that's not a sign of failure. That's a sign of having the heart of God. That's what we want, isn't it? We want to love like Jesus loves. But that makes you vulnerable. That makes you vulnerable. Yes, pray. Do commend your loved ones to God. Trust him with their lives. But accept that part of caring deeply is to be concerned continually. It's not failure, that's love. And God uses it to motivate us to prayer and to motivate us to action. And he's a good motivator. Love is a good motivator. We're going to share Holy Communion. I'm going to ask deacons, deaconesses to get that distributed for us this morning. And as we share Holy Communion, I want to share with you someone else who did some commending of, over your life. Somebody commended you to Father. Did you know that? Well, of course, I pray for you. I place you in Father's hands and pray for God to work in your home, in your life, in your relationships. I pray for you because you're valuable. You are, my dear ones. I care about you. I care about you. But I'm not the only one. In fact, 2,000 years ago, someone else was doing the same thing. Jesus. In John chapter number 17, he prayed for you. And not only for his disciples, but for those who would come to believe because of them. That's you and me. And Jesus commended you and I, placed you and I in Father's hands because Jesus was making a transition at that point. He had been the prophet that God had sent and fulfilled that ministry in fulfillment of prophecy. He was the prophet of God, speaking forth the words of Father. But now he was moving from being the prophet, speaking forth the words from Father, to being the priest. The priest who would offer the sacrifice. The prophet was becoming the priest. And the sacrifice he would make 
would be himself. He would give himself, sacrifice himself as priest and offering. What an amazing God. I want you to take that cellophane off the top and, and pull that bread out. He commended you to Father. He said, I'm going to place them in your hands now, Father. So that he could go on and pay the price for you and I. I want us to make a prayer this morning, a communion prayer of surrender, a communion prayer that surrenders everything. Would you pray with me? Right out loud, would you say, Dear Jesus, you really do love me. And I need you so much. You died in my place. You paid for my sin. And you rose from the dead. Please forgive me for all my wrong. I want you as my personal Savior, the Lord of my life. So I surrender everything to you. And I want to be like you. I want to love like you love. I want to care about people the way you care. I know this comes with a risk because caring has a cost. But it's worth the risk. The reward is worth the risk. So everything I am, Jesus, I surrender to you. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. And you are the lover of my soul and my example of how to love. Jesus took the bread, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we remember you, Jesus. We remember your love. We remember your sacrifice. And we thank you for it. Let's partake together. Jesus then took the cup, gave it to his disciples. He said, this is the cup of my blood, the New Testament, new covenant that I am making with you. It was the gift of life. Now, as we explained Wednesday, I think it was Wednesday, confusing with all the stuff we're doing with John. But in John chapter 6, Jesus makes that statement, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. The school of Hallel had an expression then, you have to eat Messiah. Now it doesn't mean cannibalism, it's not physically cannibalizing. The expression came from the time of King Hezekiah when Hezekiah was such an incredible reformer and drew them back to God. And they said, Messiah's gonna be like that. Messiah's gonna bring us back to God. And they said, we just eat up Messiah. We just eat up Hezekiah. We wanna eat him up. And it means to completely accept and gladly embrace. That's what Jesus says you need to do. You need to completely accept me and gladly embrace me. That's what we're doing. We're celebrating right now. Say right out loud with me. Say, I completely accept you, Jesus. And I gladly embrace you, Jesus. You are mine. And I am yours. Let's partake of the cup together.
Stand with me, my dear ones. I want to encourage you to love. Love the people around you. Lo even love your siblings. <laughs> love your family. Love your friends. I want you to love. I want you to be like Jesus. Yeah, it's going to have some risk. But the reward's worth it all. And in the process, there will be another reward. That's the reward of people coming to know Jesus because they saw his love in your life. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, they're going to know that you are my disciples by the love you have for one another. And Jesus said, it's, it's through loving kindness that people are drawn to God. You be the loving kindness of God to a world that needs it. I bless these men and women, Father, to be that, to be the loving kindness of God in a world so hungry for truth and love. I bless them. I bless their relationships, their home, their work, their schooling, every part of their lives to experience your fullness. In Jesus' name, amen.